Good morning, everyone. My name is Linda Williams. I'm the Senior Director of Community Engagement and Education here at IdeaStream. And we are so thrilled to have Berea Mid Park High School students, East Cleveland Shaw High School students, Warrensville Heights High School, and Warrensville Heights Middle School students here today. This is quite uh, a, a wonderful opportunity for you to be here and to not only experience these gentlemen and their stories, but to also participate in this very, very important program. Your superintendents, your principals, and your teachers thought that it was so important that you listen to the messages here about the Vietnam War and from Vietnam War veterans that they allowed you to miss school to come here. And we are so appreciative that they see the importance of you being here with us today. For those of us who have been around a long time and we experienced anti-war rallies and we even had some of our loved ones wounded or killed during the Vietnam War, this war has carried with us and the memories of the war have carried with us to the present day. And that's why it's so important that your generation of students learn about it, not just sit here kind of passively and hear some of the facts, but really learn about what happened during that war and what is the significant impact it has had on the United States today. And it's so important for your generation to really understand that because you're going to be the leaders in the future. And so we wanted you to hear the facts and to experience uh, with us uh, some of the things, uh, some of the important things that are, you can take away back to when you go back to school. So um, I am going to turn the program over today to our moderator. His name is Mike McIntyre. He's been with IdeaStream uh, for over eight years. He is the host of 90.3 WCPN, that's our NPR station, of his own radio, daily radio program called Sound of Ideas. And he has also uh, worked uh, as a writer and contributor to The Plain Dealer for the past 28 years. He has helped us in the past when we have celebrated our Vietnam War heroes as we are today. And so we're so thrilled. Uh, I'm going to turn the program over right now to Mike McIntyre. The Vietnam War was long, costly, divisive, and deadly. It pitted the North Vietnam, North Vietnamese against the South Vietnamese and the principal ally of the South Vietnamese, the United States. More than three million people, Americans, were killed in the Vietnam War. Opposition to the war in the United States bitterly divided Americans. President Richard Nixon ordered the withdrawal of U.S. forces in 1973. Communist forces ended the war by seizing control of South Vietnam in 1975, and the country was unified as the Socialist Republic of Vietnam the following year. Many veterans were not given the same welcome enjoyed by those returning from World Wars I and II, it's something I've talked about a lot with my uncles, two Marines and a Navy CB, that's CB Construction Battalion. Here are three veterans with me today who will tell you about their experiences. But before I introduce them, as Veterans Day is Saturday, can we show our appreciation now for them and for all Americans who have served their country? Very good to have you with us. Thank you. Each of our guests here will speak for a time about their experiences, and then I'm going to ask questions. And then comes the most important part of the program, and that's your questions here in the audience, in the live studio audience. So please do ask them. Think as these gentlemen are speaking about what you might want to ask. It's such a better experience if it's interactive. And also, I have the power to give you all Fs if you don't ask questions. So please, get up and ask a question. Don't risk it, because I'll do it. I will. Let me tell you who is with us here, and I, I'm as excited as you are, just seeing the props and knowing what we're about to see. If you saw the, uh, the Vietnam War on PBS, it was long. Maybe you didn't get through all of it. Maybe you saw some of it. Maybe you just heard about it. It's a heck of an education if you watch that throughout on PBS. But we're going to get that in a condensed version 
from the people who lived it, and it's really a great opportunity for all of us. By the way, when you do have a question later, there is a microphone here. We're going to be queuing up at the microphone for those questions, and I'll tell you when that time comes, but do start thinking of them. With me today is Lou Ballard. He is an Army veteran, the 1st Cavalry Division, Vietnam. Lou, very good to have you with us today. Also with me is Ted Rood. He's a Marine, and he's in the 3rd Marine Division at Vietnam, earned two Purple Hearts. Very good to have you with us, Ted. And Dave Stewart, he is with the Army as well, Vietnam, the 101st Airborne Division. Very good to have you with us, Ted. All right, these guys are each going to start, and we're going we're gonna to have uh, Lou begin. And each is going to do about 10 minutes of education for you. I'll throw some questions in there. Think about yours. We're going to be adding them in just a minute. Lou Ballard, the floor is yours. Thank you. As uh, Mike said, I'm, my name's Lou Ballard, and you're in the presence of uh, probably a dinosaur. I say that because... I am probably one of the last draftees that you will ever meet. Not that I personally am the last one, but the draft program is pretty much non-existent today. It's a volunteer army. So we, uh, we're different. We, were, we received a letter. I actually have my original draft letter here, if someone would want to see it after this program. The letter came, my mom cried, and I went off to war. Every soldier's experience is different. I was incredibly, incredibly fortunate in my drafting, being drafted. A lot of draftees, the majority of them, wound up as 1-1-Bs, 1-1-Bravos, grunts, infantry. 1-1-B is a military acronym for uh, military occupational status. Those guys, the vast majority, wound up in the field with a rifle, like these two gentlemen. And it was, a, it was a tough road to hoe. I was fortunate in that I was assigned to radio repair. And then when I got to Vietnam, approximately 30 of us were sent to Vietnam uh, in the same group. And three of us were fortunate enough to wind up in companies where we did not go into the field. We were not assigned to carry the radio we actually fixed the radio. My job was to repair radios for five airfields that we operated throughout the central highlands of Vietnam. In that capacity, I traveled around the country. It was, uh, it was an interesting thing. You, you, didn't, uh, you didn't schedule a flight. You went down to the airfield and said, is anyone going out to this LZ, this landing zone? And they said, yeah, this ship here down at this row and this, this bunker is going out. You ran down, you go, do you have room? Sure, you got on and you flew out. In hindsight, that was a crazy thing to do because there was no record of where I was. If that ship went down, was shot down or crashed because of mechanical failure, no one knew where I was. No one would ever know. And that is uh, something that, that haunted me at the time to the point that I... Uh, I scratched my initials inside my wedding ring so that uh, if they found me, maybe they could identify me if my dog tags were missing. Those are the kinds of things that haunt you. Even though I never had the opportunity to fire my weapon in anger, I was there, I took the risk, I accepted the responsibility, and I did my job. When I went in this service, it seemed appropriate that you answered your nation's call. Today, that sounds trite and, and shallow. But in the late 50s, 1960s, we still had honor and we still revered the warriors of World War II and Korea and even some World War I vets that were still around. So it was a part of our nation's DNA to serve, to go, to do what you were called to do. The thought of going to Canada, of leaving my friends to do my job for me, never occurred to me. You just stepped to the mark, did what you were told, took the oath. And yes, I took the oath. Can I ask you, how, how old were you when you were drafted? Uh, let's see. I was uh, 19. 19. Think about that. Some of the some of the students here may be about that age or just, just below it. Yeah, I, uh, I'm part of Rolling Thunder. 
and then I don't know if anyone knows what Rolling Thunder is. We are an organization. The media portrays us, unfortunately, as a motorcycle group. That is not our mission. Yes, many of us do ride motorcycles, but our mission of Rolling Thunder is to demand an accounting from our government of all the missing and all the POWs and all the MIAs from all wars. And that's why we go to Washington each Memorial Day. That's not a parade, it's a protest. It's probably the most peaceful protest for something that size you will ever witness. Last year in the Pentagon parking lot, we had 900,000 motorcycles, all there with the express purpose of asking our government to provide an accounting for and a return of all of our MIAs and POWs. And MIAs are people missing in action. That's Miss, what the initials Missing are. in action. And POW, the initials Prisoner are prisoners of war. Of war. Right. Uh, you want them returned. And you just mentioned how easy it seems it could be to be missing in action because, as you mentioned, if your chopper goes down somewhere, no one knows where you are. That person could still be in that spot today. Vietnam is, has probably changed in the last 50 years. I'm sure it has. But at the time, it was vast stretches of jungle with very little life, very little villages or, or establishments where someone would see you go down. So if you crashed, you weren't seen. No one would know. And there are still, I was just in Washington this past weekend at our national conference listening to our stats as we, uh, we discuss our mission. There are still 1,602 unaccounted for POW slash MIAs from the Vietnam War. There are thousands, thousands more from World War II, Korea. There's even 126 from the Cold War. People that we sent out to do their job, to, to fulfill their mission, that they've gone missing and are unaccounted for. We want them accounted for. If nothing else, to give their families closure, to bring the body home, and have a place to bury them. Lou, you mentioned the draft. Today, if you're in military service, you've volunteered to be in it. You've joined, you've joined the Army. That's correct. Or the Marines or whatever it might be. Can you, for the benefit of our students, explain what you mean by the draft? People had to register, and you were, whether you wanted to or not, chosen to go to war. Actually, it's still the law. When you, to register. When you register, when you, when, and uh, not sexist, ladies and gentlemen, but when the men turn 18, when you graduate from high school, your high school will probably go through the process. You'll sign some papers. You won't even really realize what they are. You are registering for the draft. You are on file somewhere in case this nation should need you. Um, as I say, uh, I was drafted by local board 24, uh, downtown Cleveland. Uh, I remember distinctly the, uh, lady who ran the board was this sweet little old gray-haired grandmotherly lady that I didn't think would hurt anyone, but she sent me to Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned you didn't go to Canada. You, had, you stood and you took the oath. What does that mean? Did people try to escape the draft and go somewhere else? Some did. Some did. Um, it, it, here's a phenomenon of, of the Vietnam War. We were those who served were approximately 10% of their peer group. That's the people in that age group. But we were 3% of the total population that served in, in the, during the Vietnam era. Only 3%. Anyone have any idea how many today serve? It's less than one half of 1% are defending this country. That's a testament to their, their tenacity and to the technology that they've been able to deploy. But they're, they're out there without a lot, of, a lot of backup. Lou, is this one of the kind of radios that you worked on? That's a PRC-25. Uh, Down the, in front here. If personal you communication? It's my baby. That's Ted's radio. Oh, it's Ted's radio. But <laughs> it's the kind of thing maybe you, you would have worked on? Oh, yes. That was one of them. Uh, although mostly we worked on the ones that ran the airfields, which were, right. could, and were, were Jeep-mounted as well. Was there, before we get, and I want to have Ted jump in with his thoughts now too, but was there ever any conflict? You mentioned you never had to fire your service weapon in self-defense or in anger. You didn't have to fire it, right? That's correct. So many others did, and they were, they were some of them had to crawl into tunnels and do hand-to-hand -hand combat. Yeah. 
Was there any kind of a, a caste system or a, a disparity between those who had the kind of job you had and those who were in frontline <laughs> infantry? Was there, how did you reconcile that? <laughs> you see Ted laughing here. <laughs> I guess we'll get to that. I was, uh, I was mm -hmm. rear echelon pogi. Uh, that's a derogatory term, meaning someone who doesn't do quite what they should do. Uh, I was in the rear with the gear, all of those things. And I'll tell you, frankly, I'm in awe of these two gentlemen for what they did. I never, I never had to test my mettle that way. I won't say that I never got mortared, that we never took incoming fire. I won't say that I didn't to this day, avoid unusual objects in the road because some of them would blow up. But I never tested my personal courage the way these gentlemen did. I don't think anyone could question the fact that you served your country. I hope not. You'll fight any man who does. Get a bloody nose. <laughs> Get a bloody nose. <laughs> Ted Rude is uh, the fellow in the middle here. He's the Marine who earned uh, two Purple Hearts for his service with the 3rd Marine Division in Vietnam. Ted, what do you have to say to these young people? Uh, just to go back, Mike, you mentioned something about a helicopter going down in the jungle. Uh, the MIA, MIA issue is very personal to me because I have a classmate from Chagrin Falls High School who to this day is an MIA. Uh, exactly what you mentioned occurred. It went down in the jungle. The helicopter was discovered, the chopper was discovered. However, there was no trace of any of the crewmen. There were no blood markings, there was nothing. So we certainly believe that they were taken prisoner uh, and they were alive at that time. And Wade, his name was Wade Gross, uh, he, there were actual sightings after supposedly all of our POWs were returned of Wade and uh, this raises the issue that we constantly battle for. You know, we want them all back. We want, we want them all accounted for. As for me personally, I was the guy who carried that radio that Lou fixed. Uh, not personally, he didn't fix my radios. <laughs> Actually, I did most of the work fixing my radios myself. But uh, I was trained as a radio telegraph operator in San Diego, California at MCRD, which is the Marine Corps Recruit Depot, San Diego, California. I went through recruit training at Paris Island, South Carolina. After my training, which was extensive, six months of training, I had to learn uh, continuous wave transmission, that's Morse code, and all of that, and was led to believe that, uh, oh, we don't use that below regiment, man, you've got it made. I got to v Vietnam, I got to Da Nang, and when they assigned us, I told the guy who was a radio telegraph operator, and he says, we don't use those over here. He said, you're a voice operator. He said, you'll be carrying a radio. And that's what I ended up doing. Uh, I do have two Purple Hearts. I never had a life-threatening injury. I was very lucky. Uh, the first time occurred when I was uh, ceremoniously, ceremoniously removed from uh, an amphibious tractor from the top of it when we hit an anti-tank mine, and I got blown off of it. And it broke my arm and messed up my back. Nothing, no big time, no big deal. The second one was a little bit worse, and uh, to this day I still carry a memento of that. Uh, on March 29th of 1968, a uh, gentleman in front of me tripped a booby trap grenade, and I received grenade shrapnel from that. Ted, a Purple Heart is a, a medal that you're awarded if you're injured in the line of duty? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And, and actually, I consider it kind of a, although I'm very proud to have it, and I'm very proud of anyone whose family has it. You know, it's either I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, or I did something wrong to get myself hurt. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. You can be under such heavy fire, and I'm sure Dave has been in the situation where he had guys where, where you're pinned down, you know, and, there, and there's really nothing you can do about it, but, uh, and you end up injured. But in my case, young man in front of me made a mistake and tripped a tripwire. The other one, it was kind of interesting because we ran amphibious tractors and the guy driving the track was absolutely in the tracks in front of the track behind him and it blew. And the interesting thing about that was if you were on an amphibious tractor, which was a 40 ton vehicle, a very large vehicle, the fuel cells were under the floor. 
And there were 10 fuel cells, five on each side, rubber fuel cells. And if it penetrated the hull, it burned. It was like a Ronson lighter, you know, or a Zippo lighter. For those of you who don't remember Ronson's and Zippo's. <laughs> but, a bit. Uh, a bit. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but we were very, I, w I was very fortunate. Although, you know, I was probably less fortunate when it came to artillery. Uh, when I was in the field, the, the worst battle, and you guys can look this up, was called the Battle of Daido, D-A-I-D-O. And uh, that, was, that was quite a few days. Uh, I'm not going to go into details. But it's in a book, and if you don't mind me, not because I don't believe it to be cussing if it's the title of a book, there's a book called The Magnificent Bastards. And it's about the Battle of Daido and Niha, two villages, and it's a joint Marine Corps Army uh, operations. And you can get really detailed information from that book about the battle. Uh, we actually ended up, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines ended up going against uh, the 320th North Vietnamese Division. At the start of the battle, uh, the numbers were about 40 to 1. And we took uh, Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines across the river into the battle to support 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, which was uh, having, having a hard time. So this North Vietnamese division, we figured it was about 10,000 guys, 10,000 North Vietnamese troops, and North Vietnamese troops were good troops. They were the best. I have more respect for the North Vietnamese Army than I do for the South Vietnamese Army, our friends. They were tough. They were hard. They were good fighters. And if there is such a thing, which I think is in a rare instance, they were brave. Now, uh, when it comes to bravery, I was surrounded by a bunch of heroes. I was not one, but I was fortunate enough to be surrounded by a bunch of heroes. These guys right here are my heroes. In Vietnam, it was estimated that uh, it was eight to one. For every person that was on the battlefield, every person that was engaging the enemy, there were eight people supporting them. That one person that was engaging the enemy could not possibly do his job without the people that were in the rear, in the rear with the gear. We had another name for them, but I can't say that on the air. <laughs> uh, I can't you, say that in this forum. You did say the word bastard. I can't believe that you Marines swore so much like that. You know, that's probably the mildest word there. <laughs> but one of the problems I had where I was, I was so close to the DMZ. My, my base camp was at Clavier. DMZ is the militarized demilitarized zone. Demilitarized zone. That we used to get fired with artillery from North Vietnam. They used to fire on us constantly. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, an interesting story is that we had those little cassette tapes that you could send home, and we had an individual that was, he was sending a letter when the incoming started, and he kind of tossed it down and headed for the bunker, and afterwards, when we went over it, 250 rounds on that one. And now this is a battalion-sized area, which is probably not much bigger than this building, hmm. you know, so it was... It got pretty hairy sometimes. How old were you when you started your service in Vietnam? I signed up. I joined the Marine Corps when I was 19 years old. So you weren't drafted. You joined. I joined. What was? Were you on the draft list anyway? And you decided I was. might as well do it. I was. No. What and, motivated and, you? It, well, it's an interesting story. Uh, the story of a, a young kid in love <laughs> who found out that the woman he loved, woman, girl, he loved. Uh, was back with her old boyfriend. Oh, no. Yeah, so in a, uh, a fit of macho, I was going to show her while she was with me. I had the recruiter's card in my pocket. I called the recruiter. It didn't swear at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up in the Marine Corps, and she ended up married to the other guy. Sounds like a Shonda Rhimes episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> yes. It's uh, very interesting. But... These guys that I've met since I joined Rolling Thunder, they're, they're all just wonderful men, and they do a, a fantastic job. We are on the education committee for Rolling Thunder, so we get to visit young people like you. Normally in the springtime, we'll visit different schools, and if your school wants us to come, talk to somebody at your school, and we'll come and visit, and we'll talk to you and in a little more detail. We have more time uh, that we can talk to you about our experiences, uh, about what we went through. 
we've still got a little bit of time today, and of course there will be the questions that we'll be able to get into some more detail. Let's introduce Dave Stewart into the conversation now, though, with the Army, the 101st Airborne Division. Cheers to the Airborne, right? Dave, thank you for being here. What do you have to say to our young people? Well, in uh, July of 1966, I was 18 years old, I uh, joined the U.S. Army. When I went to the recruiter, he says, uh, what do you want? And I said, well, what's the toughest thing you got? Wow. He said, uh, airborne infantry. So I said, I'll take it. So away I went. Uh, went to the 82nd Airborne Division and uh, was there probably around a year's time. And, uh, well, not quite that long, but was there for a while. And then uh, they said, hey, uh, we got some places we're, we're going to a combat zone, but you're going to another unit. So they took whole companies, and all we did was just change patches. And they put us on C-141s. We flew to Campbell, where the 101st was. And then uh, we flew out probably two months later after a little jungle training. And uh, we landed down in Coochie, Vietnam, which is way down south, but that wasn't where they planned on keeping us. And to explain, when you look at <clears throat> Vietnam on the map, it's, it's a serpent. It goes from, it's the coast, and it goes all the way down. It's a really thin, yeah. long country. So you see where well, the further the south you go, the wider the country gets. Right, too. but you're way far away from, from oh, the yeah, north from where too, we were going to go, yes. Gotcha. So uh, we landed at Coochie, and we trained at the 25th Infantry Division there. We trained at their facilities, and then uh, I think we were there like five days, I think. And then they flew our company north on C-130s. We landed at a place called Phu Bai. And uh, we went to this area, and they told us to dig foxholes. We dug these foxholes on this ridge that overlooked this jungle. And uh, little did we know that the next hill over, they were going to put Camp Eagle in there. And uh, we were to clear the area every day. We'd get up, we'd, we'd go on operations. We were to clear the, the area from there to the Perfume River. And clear the area means get that rid of means the That means get rid of all the VC and NVA that's in the, in the vicinity. So VC would be Viet Cong and NVA yes. and the North Vietnamese Army. You're yes. basically, we're not talking about clearing mm -hmm. brush here. We're talking about clearing enemies clearing out of the Clearing the enemy out, yeah. So uh, <laughs> that was our goal. We did that. And... Uh, then all of a sudden, uh, they told us, they said, uh, something's big coming down. So uh, we went to this place. Uh, it was called uh, Firebase. Uh, oh, what was the name of it? Thing. It was a big, uh, a big fire base. And they had uh, a place there. It was over a mile long where they could line the helicopters up for combat assaults. Because we were going to go on one of the largest combat assaults of the whole Vietnam War. And we were going into a place called the Ashaw Valley. And uh, the Ashaw Valley was probably the baddest place in Vietnam. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the enemy not only owned the valley, but they also had troops around the valley to protect those that were in the valley. But anyway, we were going to combat assault into the Ashaw Valley. And uh, we were to all of a sudden they started bringing companies in and we were on the outer part of the fire base and we dug in foxholes and stuff like that. And uh, in two, two mornings, we were going to, to combat assault into the valley. The, the day we went into the valley, uh, it was an awesome sight. I mean, I never seen nothing that big before. The valley's 27 miles long and at its widest point, it's two miles wide. Uh, they gave us, they had a little intel they gave us before we went in. They, they had told us that, uh, I forget how many NVA battalions and regiments and divisions that were in that valley, but there was a lot of them. Anyway, uh, we combat assault. We had 25, and it was not only the 101st, but the 1st Air Cavalry was in on this, this because we both, both units moved north. We were at Camp Eagle, they were at Camp Evans. And uh, when, when we combat assaulted in, it was real foggy that morning. And, and it was supposed to be clear weather for a couple of days. 
And uh, I can remember as we went in, all of a sudden the, the helicopters kind of went in in a, in a nosedive like this, and we thought, man, we're going to crash. Mm -hmm. But what they did was they just went in like that until they got under the cover of the, the uh, fog. But uh, they were shooting us up. I mean, we had 25 helicopters shot down, and that was the most that was ever taken down in the Vietnam War. Anyway, uh, I think it took us, it was a two-week operation. We, uh, we finally took the valley, and uh, we could see the NVA running over the valley into Laos, because once you got on the other side of, of the valley, uh, you were headed into Laos. We weren't allowed to go there. Whole other country. Exactly. So <clears throat> we could see the NVA running out, and then a couple days later they told us, okay, the valley's secure. So the helicopters come in, picked us up, took us out again, and uh, we went to this, uh, this fire base, uh, LZ Sally, and uh, we set up there, and uh, what they did was they plotted another combat assault force. Uh, if you were in the 101st or 1st Air Cavalry uh, Division, you probably, if you were a grunt in one of those units, uh, you did at least 35 combat assaults in your wow. year. You're mentioning 101st <clears throat> and your patches and your hat say 82nd. So that was because mm -hmm. you were transferred from 82nd to 101st? Yes, okay. and, and, and I served two years in the 82nd because once we left Vietnam, we went back to the 82nd Airway. The 82nd was like a big repo depot for all the airborne units that, that were in Vietnam. And there was even some regular leg units, like the 1st Air Cavalry. They had guys that, were, that went to airborne school. That Once they got out of Nam, they went back to the 82nd. Did you but, guys, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I wanted to know if, uh, from all of you, and we can, whoever wants to jump in first, but did you guys ever think about what the US policy or strategy was? We've, we've seen all of this uh, confusion over the purpose for the war and the idea of stopping the spread of communism and the protests that were at home over that. You guys don't have time for that. You're there fighting a war. But did it enter your mind, or does it now, after the fact, do you think about what the U.S. was doing? After the fact. After, after the, the fact. fact. After Definitely. the fact. While you're there, uh, when you're engaged, even, even in your day-to-day -day routine, you know, you, you've got... Uh, very little time to think about policy back in the United States, what was going on back here. We knew of the protests. How we, did that make you feel? I thought it was a bunch of, I can't say that here. <laughs> we'll find a word you can say. Hooey? I thought it was a bunch of hooey, a bunch okay. of crap. <laughs> uh, I thought it was, it, I, I think it was much more widespread than I thought at the time. I did not realize how widespread it was until I returned. Uh, but being over there day to day, Dave, you know, being, he would helicopter assault into certain areas. Dave probably spent 240 days out of his year in engagement with the enemy. Now he was, we had a tactical area responsibility, I did. We, had, we were static and we would travel from there mm -hmm. out into our tactical area responsibility and clear it, things like that. But, uh, when, when you're doing those things, you don't have time to worry about policy. The one thing I did notice, too, though, later on was what Dave talked about, clearing the Ashaw Valley, mm -hmm. leaving, and then having to go back into the same area again and fight the same enemy again. You know, so that, there's a tactical problem there when that happens. They were know. going underground or... Well, not necessarily underground, but you gave up the area. I oh, mean, you, you, gave it up. Left. you left and you they left, came back. and they would come, after they would we come left, back in. The NBA moved right back into the valley. They so would that come speaks back in. to that speaks to not just U.S. strategy politically, but the U.S. war strategy. Well, it does, but Absolutely. the U.S. War, war strategy was based on politics back here. Yes. Uh, it was kind of a micromanaged war. Lou, you know, any any uh, any book or class you take on warfare warfare, you take ground. You hold ground, you do not surrender that ground. Take the hill and then hold it. And hold it. If you do not hold territory, I mean, this goes back all the way to Sun Tzu, you know, the, the art of war. This has been known for countless centuries. And yet, in Vietnam, we would expend bodies and men, 
And to take Hamburger Hill, for example, and then to, to walk away from it the next day and let the enemy just walk right back and retake that land, that territory. When, when it no was sense. determined, when it was determined that we were going to use body count and we were going to at some time reach a threshold where we were killing more of them than they could replace, totally flawed, absolutely flawed. You know, they had young people turning 18 every day, too. You know, and they kept, and, and also they used their women. Their, their supply routes down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, probably at, at least half of those people were women that, that were carrying that artillery show. And that, that's the way it was sometimes. Someone would have a bag of rice, someone would have an artillery show or whatever, but they kept coming. So you had these questions about strategy, but you mentioned you didn't have time when you were fighting to worry about what was going back on back home. Did you worry about while you were fighting what was going on with your with your generals and 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 military leaders and why are we giving up that ground or was it just you you know you're trying to survive? Sometimes IQ was questioned as far as military strategists and as far as our, but I, I was fortunate. I had in my company, an Alpha Company, First Amphibian Tractor Battalion. We were called the Amgrunts. They took away our tracks. Uh, Bravo Company tracks used to support us, take us out on night ambushes. We became Grunts. We became Dave. And uh, I question the strategies of, in general, but not of my unit, because I had a captain, uh, excuse me, Major, Major Johnson. His name was P. Martin Johnson, and he called, it was P. Martin Johnson because his first name was Poindexter. Yeah, I'd go so, with P. <laughs> so, yeah, he went with the P. And to this day, we're still great friends. He's just a, just a wonderful man. But uh, he was also a great strategist. And uh, he did everything he could to keep us safe and still accomplish our mission. Did you feel, Dave, when you were serving that, that you were s serving an honorable cause? Yeah, I thought so. Uh, that's the reason I joined. Uh, I thought, hey, you know, I'm going to go over there and win this war for us. But when you get there, you find out it's so big, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, in 1968, when President Johnson, and, and this is what the American people got to realize, in 1968, when President Johnson stopped the bombing, it wasn't to try to get the North Vietnamese really to come back to the, uh, uh, the table to talk peace. What it was was to let them build their army because after Tet Offensive and the Spring Offensive in 1968, uh, we destroyed their armies. And they, and, they, and they couldn't hold the war on anymore. So what did Johnson do? He stopped the bombing. Uh, they moved in their troops and their equipment, and there was nothing that anybody could do about it. Hmm. And, and what it did was uh, it put us at greater risk because uh, they built their army back up again, and it, and it was nothing but a fight. I have plenty more questions, but I'd like to invite our students to start joining us now with your questions, too. So let's at least get one to start us off. Who's the bold one that's got a question? It's an F and an F. Here we go. Will you come down to the microphone, young man? And if you guys have questions, go ahead and queue up over there where the microphone is, and we'll take them one at a time. So make sure we get plenty. Can you let us know what your name is, what school you go to, and then fire away with your question? Hello, I'm Lewis. I go to Warrensville Middle School. And my question is, when y'all first joined, when y'all first went to the v Not War, was y'all like afraid of something happening? Or is y'all like, I just want to survive? That's a, that's a really good question because Dave, you were talking about, I want to do the toughest job possible. But was there fear in your heart? And did any of you have fear when oh, you were going yeah. into a war situation? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh man. Absolutely. Yes, you do. Yeah. You're not Absolutely. Iron Man. Even in the rear with the gear. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, be, before I left, I was discussing with a friend of mine while I was home on leave before I went to Vietnam. Uh, and I told him, I said, I'm not going to make it through this. I'm not going to be back. Wow. I had a premonition that I was not going to make it. Uh, what a thing at 19 years old. Yeah. They tried a couple times, but I, I ended up making myself wrong. I was wrong. Thank goodness. That's a good mistake. That's uh, a good mistake. Now I have uh, sons and a granddaughter that's the light of my life. And uh, so glad I was wrong. Uh, as far as the personal fear, the one thing that you have to remember, too, when you're engaged, and Dave will, Dave will back me up on this, 
there's no, there's no God, country, apple pie, uh, or even Marine Corps. There is this guy right here and this guy right here, the people next to you. And those are the people that you are concerned with keeping alive. And they're concerned with keeping you alive. It becomes very personal. It becomes very personal. And it comes down to not only unit, but it comes down to individuals sticking together and individuals getting each other through this as a team. If there's quick insight from either of the two of you on fear, and then we'll move to the next question. And did, sure. did Ted cover it or? Oh, yeah, he okay. covered it. Great. Lou, good? Yeah, I, I think so, but I would, I would add that I was not as afraid of dying as I was of being MIA. Or captured. Mm -hmm. Or, or captured. Captured. captured was, uh, was and that my family would not know. That was, a, that was a very for real fear. That's a great question. Thank you very much. Let's have the next. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Alyssa, and I'm from Bereamid Park. Um, what were some of the challenges coming back from war? <laughs> so I was going to move into that, and it's a great question. Coming back from this war was a little bit different than the young men and women who came back from World War II. There was a hero's welcome. For Vietnam veterans, there was not. What were the challenges? Uh, Lou, why don't you start? Mm -hmm. uh, I was stationed at Fort Meade, Maryland, and I had a car, I had transportation. And although I was married, I was the designated driver. It took a bunch of guys. We went down to Georgetown University because that's where the girls were. <laughs> and they wanted to meet girls. We walked in, I recall walking into a little coffee shop and the temperature in the room went to zero. And you heard whispers, what are they doing here? We don't want their kind here. Somebody tell them to leave. Even though we weren't in uniform, you had a posture and a position and a haircut that made you stand out like a red light. So they knew who we were, they knew we were soldiers, and that was the reception. I'll take it a little further. During the, uh, when Martin Luther King was assassinated in April of 1968, I was still at Fort Meade and I was on riot duty in Washington, D.C. And they got word that they were concerned that the Sheraton Hotel might be a target of the rioters and they might burn the hotel. So they moved us around the hotel, which was nice because we were able to get in out of the weather. But I recall distinctly walking my post up and down in front of the Sheraton to make sure nobody burned the place and across the street was a uh, young college student sitting in the window reading a book, basically just in, in his arrogance, thumbing his nose at us while he had a handmade peace symbol hanging there, indicating that we were the problem and he was the solution. Mm. How could he say that? I'm there to protect him. I'm there to keep him from being burned out of his home. And he's flipping me off? No. Ted, yeah, what about it, the reception? Well, I attended Kent State. University when I came wow. home and uh, one of the very first classes uh, and it was a uh, grad assistant that taught this class it was kind of a remedial writing class she said we're gonna go back to the basics I want you to write a essay what did you do last summer for all these 18 year old kids and so I did and I wrote about some things I probably shouldn't have written about but apparently it was pretty decent because she made the mistake, not me, she made the mistake of reading it in class. And I had a young lady jump up in class and tell me that I didn't belong there. She called me a baby killing SOB. Get out of here, you don't belong here. And I did, I left. And this poor grad assistant found out that I lived at College Towers, which ironically was 20 years later was the same place my son lived, but uh, for a while. But uh, Found, got my phone number somehow and called me and she was crying on the phone and uh, apolog very apologetic and uh, asked me if I would return. And I said, on two conditions. And she said, what are they? I said, you will never read anything that I write again out loud in that class. Mm -hmm. She said, not a problem. She said, I'm so sorry. And she started, I said, no, no, wait for the second condition. And she said, what is it? And I said, I've got an A in the class. And she said, no problem. No <laughs> Way to problem. parlay. Nice so work. So it worked out. A quick, 
thought on that before our next question, Dave, this idea, and what Ted just said, people were being called baby killers and spat upon, so different in, term, in, return, in terms of returning home. And when you enlisted, you were enlisting as, as a patriot and someone who wanted to help the country. What did that reception do to you? It didn't do much to me. I know uh, when I came home, uh, the military had told us, when, when you leave post, take your, your uniform off. So what we did when we left post, we got rid of our, our uniform and we put on civilian clothes, uh, trying to look as inconspicuous, but the, the haircut always gave you away. <laughs> Especially in those days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I really and truly, I had no problems at all. Okay. I mean, if somebody would have. Mike, if I could add really quickly. Yeah. Right. Although I had that happen. When I came home, I came home to the most supportive wonderful family, an extended family. We have a rather large family in the world. And I and had very little of that, you know, as far as it was when I was at Kent State that I had that problem. But when I was in a situation, a home situation, they there, were outstanding. There are other issues coming home, not just reception. Post-traumatic stress disorder for many Vietnam veterans. Illness from Agent Orange and other things, cancers and other things that have come from their service. Uh, briefly, Lou, is our country paying enough attention to the after effects of Vietnam, the Vietnam War? Uh, no. Interesting you mentioned that. Currently there is a bill that has gone through committee and is waiting to be presented to the floor of Congress. It's called the Blue Water Navy uh, bill. What it will do is allow blue water sailors, guys who, whose ships were well offshore of Vietnam, to claim Agent Orange um, damage. damage because <laughs> they took the water out of the ocean, ran it through the desaliation unit, and drank it. Well, that's fine, except the rivers where we sprayed the Agent Orange and it flowed into the rivers, it flowed out into the ocean. So these gentlemen are subject to, to uh, uh, Agent Orange uh, in effects as those of us who were on the ground, boots on the ground. And to explain Agent Orange, it's a defoliant. It's a chemical right. that you dropped on the jungles and then all the leaves would essentially wither away and then you could you could That see picture the enemy. up on the wall behind us, those trees, that's not fire. That's Agent Orange, defoliation. Yes, sir. My name is Dominic. I'm from Bereavement Park High School. My question was, what was the connection between your squadron and you know the people that you were with every day? Can, can you repeat that just one more time? What was the connection between the people like in your squadron and who you, you were with every day? So you're the people in your battalion, your squadron, what you just said, the man to your right and to your left. My brothers. Uh, your brothers. And, and uh, Dave, is it, it, are they seen, were they seen then as brothers immediately, and are you brothers today? Yeah. Uh, I still call some of those guys, and they call me. And... Uh, Matter of fact, we're going on a road trip here in January, me and three of them. We're going to take off and travel around the country just for the heck of it, you know. Because, uh, you know, when you get into that crap and, and, and you survive it, uh, you have a very close-knit group, you know. And I don't think anything can ever break. What was know? it like to lose one of those brothers? Because so many... People die. You go to the wall, I'm sure, in Washington, and you see the name. Um, can you kind of explain that experience that many of us have never had? Well, um, I would never go to the wall. No? No. I, I know too many names that are on it. Uh, but uh, we had a friend that was real close. And, and in the 70s, when me and these guys got back together, there's, there's three of us, four of us. And uh, we would try to get a hold of him, and we searched and searched and searched, and uh, never could find him. You know where he lived? He lived in Washington, D.C., working for the government. Oh, <laughs> but he died. Oh. He died here a couple of years ago, and, and uh, that was a kick in the pants. Okay. I traveled to New Hampshire. I traveled to West Virginia. I traveled to Rochester, New York, uh, all for friends. Uh, in 2006, uh, we were 
honored to have a wall in the reading room at the Alfred Gray Research Center at Quantico, Virginia, dedicated to my outfit because we're an outfit unique to the Marine Corps. We're a mechanized outfit that they took away our tracks, made us a grunt outfit. And uh, I, have, I have another unique thing too. The, the, the gentleman that I replaced as the radio man for the second platoon of Alpha Company, 1st Amtrak Battalion, actually was KIA, which is killed in action the day I arrived. Oh boy. Uh, his name was Tom Solis, and I think they pronounce it Solis, a Hispanic guy. 25 years later, we found his daughter, who was born after he left for Vietnam, never met his daughter. She was born after he was in Vietnam. Uh, her name is Linda McBrayer. She lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Finding her, now she comes to all of our reunions. She's become our company daughter. And she gave me the extreme honor. We did a ceremony at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at Arlington. And she asked me, she said, we both have the same relationship with my father. We didn't know him, but we love him dearly. And she wanted me and gave me the honor of presenting the wreath, taking the wreath up and presenting the wreath. When there were all these other guys that had served with their dad there. So it was kind of funny, but it was, it was quite an honor. Go ahead. All right, we're going to do, here's our plan now. We're going to do kind of lightning round. One of the three of you will pick, we'll cho you'll choose amongst yourself to make an answer. We'll try to be brief, and because I see... Now we have Happily, some people up we there. have a bunch of people, and we're going to ask as many questions Good. as we can. Next, yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Brittany. My name is Brittany from Brady. Can you get Park close to the microphone, please? If you could go back and change anything, what would you change? Like, I didn't understand. We, we can't. If you could move. If your I mouth, could change anything, yeah. what would I change? Okay, sorry. Thank you. Go ahead. You're the guy with the ears. You I got guess. it. Uh, I don't think anything. I, I've I've had a great life since then. I met wonderful people while I was there. Uh, the thing that I would change probably is that I probably would have stayed in the Marine Corps, which I should probably have done. But, you know, I've got great children. I've got two great sons and uh, so many great friends, so many great friends, brothers. Lou, what would you change about Ted? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Oh, like, we'd, we'd move him in the Army. There's a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Camille Gibson. I'm a student from Shaw High School. And I was just wondering, how were you, like, to able to stay sane in war, knowing that you had family back at home? Like, stay sane. Like, how were you able to maintain I'll take that one. Okay, and, and can you repeat the question for the rest of the audience? I believe what she said is, how did we stay sane knowing we had family back home? Right. How did you stay sane? <laughs> well, I got a letter almost every day from the young lady sitting over there. This young uh, lady? Yeah. <laughs> we married nine days before I shipped overseas. Wow. And, you know, they say teenage weddings never work out. Well, we're still here. So that connection sustained That you. connection. She wrote me just about every day, and I wrote back pretty often. Um, and one of the things she did that, and I'm sorry guys, this, this one's gonna hurt your feelings. About once a week, she would make cookies and pack them very carefully and ship them overseas. Once my mail clerk found out that I was getting fresh cookies, I got my mail before anyone else in the company, <laughs> and he got the first cookie. <laughs> A good point, just the last thing on that question is, what about the sanity of the poor mothers, brothers, and fathers that were here? And sisters. While we're, and sisters that, that were here while we were over there. Sons and daughters. That, yes. were, that had no idea from day to day whether we were safe or we were still alive. Or, or what about the mother, which happened to my mother a couple times, that gets the telegram, you know? Poor mom. I mean, she was... She was God's best. She really was. My dad uh, got a hold of our congressman. I hadn't uh, right contacted away. them or anything since I'd been in Nam, and it, a couple months had went by. So they called him, and he called the Army, and next thing I know, I'm getting a visit from my CO. Then you're going to write your mom and dad a letter. <laughs> <laughs> and remember to right do now. that from now on. Right now. Next question, yes. Hi, I'm Ray, and I'm from Bria Med Park High School, and my question was, um, knowing that the American public was 
not uh, supportive of the war, was there ever a point where you were discouraged about your actions? No. I think that's probably a one-word answer. Yeah. No. no. Okay. No. 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 And, and, and by the way, there was, a, there was a large portion of the population that was a lot less vocal that did support us. Yes. And, and a lot of people don't realize that now. Yes, sir. Hello, gentlemen. Mr. Ali from Warrensville Heights High School. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all three of you for your service. Uh, Lou, you. Ted, and Dave, thank you very much. You. I know often as veterans, you get questions like, when did you fire your weapon or did you kill anyone or anything like that? What I would really like for our students, young people here, if you would share a story of heroism and uh, something along those lines, something positive from your experience in, in Vietnam. Well, in Phu Kien, uh, that was a, a big battle in May of 1968. Uh, I think everybody was a hero. Uh, there was no problem. I mean, we overran the NVA positions and uh, President Tu was with uh, General Barsanti flying overhead over the battle. And they told us that uh, President Tu said to him, I never seen such bravery bravery of soldiers before. He, he said, look at the way they're overrunning them NVA positions. He said, I want every one of those soldiers to get a gallantry cross. That's this one right here. And everybody in the 2nd Brigade and 101st Airborne was awarded uh, a gallantry cross just by the actions of our company that day. Um, can we go a little bit over organizers? Yeah. Okay, so we'll take the rest of these we'll questions. Okay. okay, terrific. Yes, ma'am, next Hi, question. Hi, I'm Laura Mateka, and I'm from Berea Midpar High School. I was just wondering if either any of the three of you or anyone you knew after coming home from the war Say felt again. either any one of you or um, people that you knew coming home from the war if you dealt with post-traumatic stress. So let's talk about yes. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, a huge problem for veterans of more recent wars as well, the yeah. Gulf War and, and, and going back to the Vietnam War when it really became a thing. It wasn't just shell shock anymore. We started to call it PTSD. Do you have any personal experience of friends uh, or fellow soldiers or fellow Marines that had PTSD? I get paid 30% the most you can get for PTSD from the, uh, from the VA. Uh, when I first came home, uh, I'd suffered very immensely with it. And I would lay awake at night, and especially after about, I became a buck sergeant and became squad leader. And sometimes you gotta tell people to do things that quite possibly could get them killed. And I used to think if, if Joe Blow got killed, I used to think, man, what could I have done differently uh, that maybe might have kept him alive? And you think about it, you think about it, you lay awake at night and think about it, and really and truly, there's nothing you could have done. I mean, it had to be done. Dave, yeah. how do you deal then with your PTSD? Did you get treatment for it? Yeah, I, I used to go, and, and what really helped me, I mean, I, when I first came home, I couldn't talk about any of this. But what really helped me was down in Ravenna at the, at the VA clinic down there, they used to have these uh, group meetings and I can remember the first couple weeks we went there they had three counselors there and they would try to get us to talk and no one would say anything and then the lady would ask a question and go to each person what do you got to say about that and we would answer them very briefly at first and then as time progressed we all started opening up started talking started sharing things and uh, when I first came home, I used to take medication for it. Uh, they, well, they dope you up a little bit, that's what it is. But then after about six months, I got rid of the garbage. And through time and going to the, the, the clinic and stuff like that, uh, you're able to talk about it. And that's why I'm able to talk to you now. A thought and time. this, yeah. and Rolling Thunder, groups like this. With me, it was reunions. We would get together, and we always had a party room at the hotel wherever we were, whether we were at Quantico or Paris Island. We've had them there with Tampa, Florida. We've met all over the place. But 
to sit around and have with someone like Dave and say, hey, you remember the time. Things that I used to, wasn't sure were real in my mind that they said, that I could say, oh my God, it really did happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I, now, yes, I remember that. Do you remember the time when you went up the river with Uncle Mo? Uh, the North Vietnamese closed off the river and we actually were responsible for getting it opened again. But uh, things like that, conversation, talking, uh, family. Uh, when my son was quite young, he, inter he actually interviewed me and wrote a, a little book on it, which I treasure. Now he's 43 years old, and I still treasure him, I think. And a thought on that from you, Lou, on PTSD? Also, alcoholism <laughs> and a lot of other things that... that Even when you're not from. in combat, being in a combat zone will leave a mark on you. When I got home, <clears throat> I arrived home in, in uh, late December of 1967 and stayed at my, my parents' apartment at that time, and... I did not go to sleep, I don't know, for about three days because no one was on guard duty. Mm. Someone had to be on guard duty. And when I did finally lay down and try and go to sleep with my wife, I crawled out of bed after she fell asleep and lay on the floor because that put me below the level of the windows where I'd always been sleeping below the level of sandbags. So just those things. Wow. Um, we went... <laughs> We went to see my family down south. Uh, we were in a, stayed in a motel in Kentucky, and it happened to be next door to a, a fire station. Well, in base camp, when we were under fire, they sounded a siren. But by the time the siren went off, they were walking mortars all the way through your company area. Mm -hmm. So it was almost too late. Well, that siren went off, and I came up out of the bed, and I could not find my boots nor my rifle. She's telling me, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> it's a great question. I didn't follow my own rule, but I knew you would all have really great insights on that to that terrific question. Just a few more. Next one. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm Taylor Perrier from Berea, and I wanted to know how it made you guys feel getting treated so poorly even though you knew you were doing what you were supposed to do. I didn't hear that. Say, can you, one, one more, more time. time. Didn't hear it. I wanted to know how it made you guys feel getting treated so poorly even though you knew what you were supposed to you were doing what you were supposed to be doing. So again, about the reception uh, uh, in, in the United States, just a, maybe one of you can, can take that. So we've kind of talked was, about that. I was, I was angry, but I, I mostly, my anger was internal. I think that uh, had I not had problems returning with myself, I think I could have taken it much better. But we all battled, we all battled our own individual problems, problems within ourselves. Uh, my son, my older boy's mom, can attest to that. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is James Stewart. I wanted to know what is, what is something that m can mentally mess up somebody being in Vietnam? I don't, did you get that? No, I'm sorry. Please, one more time. I wanted to know what is something that can mentally mess you up being in the Vietnam what, War? What can mentally mess you up being in Vietnam? Seeing combat. someone kill, combat, seeing someone kill. Carnage. All right, we'll have our next question. Okay. Hi, I'm Shanesha Johnson. I'm from Shaw High School. I was wondering if um, were there any experiences that you've um, had before you went to war that led to you wanting to go to war? Interesting. What about your experiences as children and young teenagers? Would it have set you up for what it is you did or make you want to go to war? You, Dave, said, I wanted the toughest job there was. What, what was it that made you be that guy? Well, uh, my uncle was a paratrooper. Uh, my dad, he was in the uh, U.S. Army Air Corps. Punk. <laughs> But uh, I wanted to be like my uncle. And uh, when I went and I told the uh, recruiter that, he goes, what you want is airborne infantry. <laughs> boy, <laughs> boy, he set you, you up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oops. Uh, what about, uh, by the way, that is... Um, An Eldoy. And that is a, a dress of, uh, of Vietnamese, Vietnamese people? Vietnamese That's, um, the Vietnamese 
people revered education. Something they respected it, something I hope these kids will learn. So as a symbol that you were going to school, the young girls would wear the white aldoi, and that was their garb, that was their school uniform, and it was a real mark of honor in their community because not all, by no means, did all of them get to go to school. I see sandals here too on a... Uh, that was the traditional hat. The sandals, sandals are made out of an army truck tire. That was what we called the Ho Chi sandals. <laughs> Ho Chi Minh sandals, and they're... They're virtually indestructible. Our Uncle Ho's sandals. Could, could anything have prepared you, by the way, the other two of you? Was there anything in your upbringing that prepared you for what you faced in war or made you want to go to war? No. 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 Nothing. No. Nothing can prepare you for that. No. And we have, I think, do we have one more question? One more? Just one more. Yes, sir. I'm Sergeant First Class Harris, currently serving with the 13th Federal 100. I had a question for you on the end to the right. Thank you for your service. Thank You're you. welcome. <laughs> question for you. Currently working at Warrensville as one of the security officers and coaches. Um, the movie We Were Soldiers, that was the same place you were in. No, we were further up north. We were up in the I Corps. We were soldiers. Was in the I Drang. So that was lower. He was in the A Shaw. How accurately was that movie produced? It was pretty accurate. Pretty yeah. close. Yeah. Probably in the 70, 80 percentile. What about other Vietnam movies? Are there some that are just like, come on, and some that are, <laughs> yeah. wow, that's exactly what. Apocalypse yeah. Now. Apocalypse, Apocalypse Now, now is like, come on. No surfing. <laughs> come on. <laughs> Everything that happened in Platoon probably actually happened, but not all the one unit in that compressed time frame or where they all would have been dinky dow. That's Vietnamese for crazy. <laughs> yeah. and I, know, uh, I know the part where these, these burning the uh, human waste. Right. I know that happened. That part's true. <laughs> that part's true. Uh, Lastly, did you see the documentary, The Vietnam War, on PBS? Yes. Yes. And, and what, did, uh, what did that do, do you think, to our understanding of the war or the way you felt as you watched it? Can you give me a quick reaction to wrap up our conversation, Lou? Yes, first? I can. Uh, I recently, uh, I was, as I said, I was in Washington, D.C. at our national convention, and that topic came up. And I asked the group, about, to, about 200 people had seen the documentary, and I asked them, do you feel that it portrayed the American fighting man in a favorable light? The answer was no. Hmm. I would give it an A for its correctness as far as date, time, place, and, and historic events. But I felt like at the end of it, it was 1968, and I was still a baby killer. Context. Ted. Context. You know, uh, they showed it, which, which happened. I, I, do not deny anything they showed in, the, in that documentary happened. They showed a guy burning a, uh, a hooch in a village. A hooch was their living quarters. And normally a village would call the ville. And it showed him burning that. Without explanation afterwards that this was an absolutely rare occur occurrence. It, it, it just didn't happen. I know I didn't burn anyone while I was over there. I know he didn't burn anyone while I was over there. Yeah, it, it did happen, absolutely. As he put in there, it did happen. But how often did it happen? Okay. Now, I left you wondering that. And last thought, Dave? Uh, we went into a, a village one time, and it was a VC village. And uh, That's the enemy. Yeah. And, and we had some Chinese nuns that were operating with us, and there was a guy from the CIA that was ahead of them. And uh, we were told not to take any part in any of the atrocities. And uh, you know, I'm not going to cover that one village. That was that was terrible. But uh, the second one we went into, uh, I had taken a, an incendiary grenade out and I tossed it up on top of this hooch and it caught in fire. And uh, my lieutenant come tearing down through there. Who threw that? Who threw that? And platoon sergeant was standing right next to me, and I figured he'd say he did, <laughs> but he never said a word. You know, he, he just stood there. Well, that hooch blew up, and it caught the whole side of the village, and there was two or three of those hooches blew up. They had one, one 22 millimeter rockets buried, embedded in the, uh, the thatched sides of the, of the, 
of the hooch that they fired at Camp Eagle. And uh, the explosion knocked us down. And uh, I can remember the platoon sergeant when he, when we got up. He says, "You got anything else to say, sir?" <laughs> he just said, "Carry on. Hell of a good job." <laughs> that would be it, <laughs> guys. I really appreciate the three of you for sharing with all of us your stories. And uh, I want to introduce their names again so we can all give a round of applause to Lou Ballard, Ted Rude, and Dave Stewart, <laughs> veterans of Vietnam. And I'm Mike McIntyre, thanks so much for coming.